the, the, the real goal is to head back to the global warming, that we'd like to know if you increase CO2. The big question is not so much what will CO2 do, it's what will the clouds do. And the only records we have that we can get information are these ones. I'll stop there. Let's see, there are the, the argument advanced by Winsen that uh, we shouldn't really concentrate on CO2 as clouds. And he's been castigated for that. Uh, so, we, so we focus in on CO2, which is a relatively minor greenhouse gas relative to the vapor, which is a major greenhouse gas. And we also focus in on the interglacial and what CO2 may do to that rather than the glacial. So it, I really, it's not really a scientific question, it's more of a social question. What, what has caused us then to focus in on the two things that might not be the most important things to focus in on? Those two things about uh, CO2, well, you mean? CO2 versus clouds yeah. and interglacial versus a, a little more warming in the interglacial versus uh, where Homo sapiens don't do too well, namely the glacial. Yeah. The, 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 the first one, I think, is common knowledge. There's any number of articles, even the, the review in Nature, they acknowledge clouds. So you don't give Linsen undue credit. Uh, <laughs> Linsen gets castigated for other things. <laughs> but uh, everyone agrees with him. Clouds is the big issue. Uh, it's, uh, maybe somebody in the room can comment. Uh, but what surprised me is, is I have a group of people who agree with me. And I've arranged some informal meetings with the people who know the measurements. I don't know how they know what they know. I'm impressed that they can say there was glaciers covered New York City 20,000 years ago. All they have to do is walk into Central Park. I find it amazing that they can have this. I don't know how they know that. So I feel I have to talk to them. Should I trust this? Uh, from their side, uh, what I feel the mistake they made is to trust models. Models are there to be tuned, to be tested. Uh, I'm not aware in the paleo world of the models, of the paleo data being used to test the models or to improve the models. People will simulate the Pliocene or the last glacial maximum and give you the result uh, and never discuss whether you should believe this result. Uh, people should be much more skeptical of models. That's why it said to me the most persuasive evidence that we should be concerned about global warming is this plot. It's really very disturbing if you think about what's going on here. Mm -hmm. the, uh, um, we shall see the warm world 40K world and 100K world. And, and what you talked about, the least of all, is the world we're in now driven by the eccentricity. And yet, that's the weakest solar insulator. But the least uh, potent yeah. variable in solar insulation, and yet it's dominated as far as ice volume is concerned. And, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, that's one point. What you're leading to is why go from a, a more powerful solar insulator, such as precession in the 40K world, to the 100K world, where it's much weaker. But, but that's a classic question, I know, in technology. Yeah. Then the, then the follow on question is what's next? Will we go back to a 40K world and then back to a warm world? Uh, if you, assuming we take away the red bar right. at the uh, end. No, so we should indeed be able, if there's only these three components and we know how each one works, we should be able to tell what happens next. The, the reason I didn't say much about precession, I was just time. <laughs> I was running out of time. The uh, precession, actually, I completely agree with you, is our best handle on this whole problem. Uh, it, it simply, so if you ask why did the models advance to the degree they have, 
the climate ones is because we simulate the seasonal cycle. Right? It's the biggest climate change we see. And the snag with the seasonal cycle is the time scale is so short that it changes in ocean circulation. Sure. Is not. So we need additional tests. However, we can't simulate an obligatory cycle. It's just out of the question, 40,000 years. NCAR is running some model for the last 10,000 years. It's a major, major investment. So to propose that we run cycles repeatedly to test cloud parameterizations, this is just not in the works. So I would claim we can simulate precession because it tells us about the seasonal cycle. And so our focus should actually be there because that doesn't take much computer time. Whatever we do is going to require repeated simulations to try different cloud. I mean, the big advance with weather prediction is just the running repeatedly. If something goes wrong, you go back and you reinvestigate your assumptions. And so we just have to accept that's a fact of life. We, have to, we need the measurements. We need to test the models truly, run them repeatedly. Uh, and then on that basis, they'll improve. And so the, the one optimistic side, we've actually run a model for uh, the Pliocene. So people in England at the Hadley Center ran a model for the Pliocene, got the water equated to be cold, and declared that therefore this debate about the measurements uh, settled that the water must have been cold. It never occurred to them that their model could be wrong, that they should have tuned the model. So we then asked what would it take to get warm conditions. And the surprising result was you had to change the clouds in high latitudes. The clouds in what? In high latitudes to get the tropics right. So I feel that the, we're lacking this broad view of the problem. You're not going to fix any one thing by just fiddling here. At the moment, IPCC has something called a PMIP for one of their focuses on the last glacial maximum. And they're running a huge number of experiments on this. And I would again question that strategy. Uh, so even if you get the last glacial maximum right, it's a bit like, so now you have two cases. You can get today right and you can get that one right. Uh, how do we know? It, it just has to be holistic. You have to do lots of different cases. So is it possible that we're going to go back into a completely dominated world? Is that, that we're in a very weak cycle now? Interesting question. Uh, if I, we, I don't go into detail, but so I claim there are two stages here. And you can sort of see the trend goes, and then the trend stops. And so what puzzled me a long time, I would claim that this trend is actually the cooling trend of the sawtooth. So there's not really a competition between obliquity and sawtooth. It's just that the sawtooth superimposed on the, so here it's clear, the trend is so slow, you see 40K. You call this the 40K world. Over here, the trend has become so fast. There is 40K if you look carefully, but it, it's so short, it only lasts for 90K. You see two cycles at most. So what the big question is, what is the year to accelerate the trend? Now, there's interesting results. Dust levels, as it gets colder, there's more and more dust in the atmosphere. The dust is important for the CO2 in the Southern Ocean. So it's thought that a new feedback, the CO2 feedback, didn't come into play until around the year. Uh, because it, you need to be quite cold with a lot of dust, which brings iron. Uh, I'm out of my depth now. I was just talking to Danny Sigmund and so on. And there are beautiful records of dust for the last three million years. And indeed, the dust doesn't pick up until you get quite recent. And so, it, so I would claim stop the dust, and we'll be back in a 40K world. Uh, we have to, if we, you can, the, the 40K has gone away. It's just that this has become so dominant. Anyway, so the, the beauty of this is it opens lots of new possibilities and new questions that need to be addressed. That I feel that the current approach doesn't really support or encourage exploration of such questions. 
if, if you ask, you know, why is this, why is that uh, interglacial so long? It started 10,000 years ago, whereas 125,000 years ago was much shorter. Then, uh, I think the next is the next picture. I'll just continue again. Uh, yeah, this one, eccentricity is quite small today compared to here. The answer would be that the three interactions of the three drivers are different. Exactly. So we have a wonderful test. If we go back 125, nature has done an experiment where it made eccentricity much bigger. And we should be able to figure, just comparing these two, uh, the other two, namely obliquity and the sawtooth, were doing about the same thing then as now. The big change was in precession. So I think much of the change could be due to precession. Any students or questions? So with increasing temperatures, we would expect cores to have more cloud cover due to having more moisture in the atmosphere, is that a core is going to cause a positive feedback at the end, in the long run? I really don't know. <laughs> the, the, I suppose I'm a reductionist by heart, so I, I'd like to think if you simplify things, you get a better <laughs> understanding. But there are some people who will play things emerge out of complexity, <laughs> new modes. So maybe some of these modes are there because it's complex. I mean, so these are already filtered records. I, I, in any period like this, if, if you go to the core from Greenland, the details you can get are enormous. I mean, there's lots of fluctuations buried. How do I know that? Uh, let's put another example is we can explain the seasonal cycle and why is it warm in New York and summer and cold in winter? And I miss a big, big part of the reason if I throw out weather. So weather is responsible for transporting weather systems, transport heat, cold weather. The whole purpose of weather is to do that. And it's a huge, I've forgotten the exact percentage, but much of the heat transported is through eddies, namely weather. So who am I to throw out younger dryers? <laughs> it could be a big part of the story. The, so it's just my reductionist bias that tells me simplify as much as possible. The, it, it's entirely conceivable. Boris is very fond of eddies. He will probably tell us that this is all controlled by turbulence. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Clouds um, increase albedo, but they're also trap heat. So, which is the more important factor? Or does it depend on what the clouds and where you are? And exactly. And that, that's the big, big question. So, in the world of today, uh, the clouds cool the planet. Pardon? in the world of today. So, so clouds warm the planet because it's a greenhouse gas. It cools the planet because it reflects. In the world of today, the cooling wins over the warming effect. But will that be the case in some other world? So the only clouds we know is those of today. And we certainly don't know about clouds 20,000 years ago. So we have to go very indirectly and try to infer uh, what was the role of clouds. Can it be done with salinity changes? So, so local salinity changes. Because uh, you need aerial proxies for, for local salinity changes. Yes, yeah, so, so some people will claim a, a, you need this business of dust is critical also for cloudiness. The, the clouds won't form unless you have particles for them to deposit on. So it's conceivable that the last glacial maximum was cloudy because of more dust and more salt, right? Salt are also particles that can
can have clouds form. And there are some people in the global warming business who want to run ships and pump ocean water into the atmosphere to get more salt, and this will create more clouds, and that will offset. <laughs> uh, so it depends whether you have stratus clouds, they reflect a lot of sunlight. Those are the clouds that you get over the cold water or the cumulus. So you need very deep clouds for a greenhouse effect. Uh, you need the shallow clouds don't do much by way of warming, by way of a greenhouse effect. They mostly reflect sunlight. But the, the whole cloud, the, the, the cloud is the big problem. Yeah. How about how about the what is the relative change in? I haven't really thought about calculating salinity change with uh, sea level with the Last glacial glacial advance and retreats. You've got the vicinity Simian salinity crisis, which knocked the salinity at the end of the Miocene, which knocked the salinity down about a part per thousand, if I recall, or one and a half, something like that. Uh, and uh, but uh, do you know what the what the fluctuation? Well, is? we know how much ice there was. Yeah, uh, do you know what, the, what, what? Do you know how much it? The salinity, uh, kind of the average ocean salinity, fluctuates with the uh, with glacial uh, buildup. No, but you know, you can. I think I've been to 31. Yeah, you can calculate. A ratio of the yeah. difference in water volume. Yeah, but the, the snag is that if you, if you look at the salinity today in the ocean, the highest salinities are right at the surface, even though it's the densest water. So we have no idea the last glacial maximum what was salinity like. All those glaciers came from evaporation. So the salinity probably was highest at the surface. It wasn't uniformly distributed. And it's sort of interesting. Uh, I think it was, today is what, 35 parts per thousand? I think it was down to 30, 31. It was significantly higher. Uh, I'm sorry, it must be the other direction. It must have been close to 40. Uh, but uh, more important would be where was the maximum salinity? Uh, was it, it must have been at the surface, I would submit. Salinity was that much higher. It must be. It, it must be showing up in the in the uh, uh, isotope uh, or the trace metal uh, trace element uh, signals. And I don't recall anybody talking about that kind of salinity change with the uh, in the paleo record. Yeah. <laughs> I think they inferred it mostly from uh, sea level change. Mm -hmm. the, uh, another beautiful thing about what they do is this consistency. So you can, they can tell you from land measurements how much ice there had been. But then they can also go to, I'm sure there are experts here on sea level, but sea level fluctuated, they can tell you exactly. And then the pictures is quite consistent that emerges. There are lots of independent observations that contribute to it. I'm just thinking that with the increased uh, deep ocean circulation, or <coughs> increased ice formation, that a good deal of that salinity was in the deep ocean. I wonder if there's a paleo proxy to show that. Well, I know it was through evaporation, so it must have started at the surface. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to answer your question, most of the proxies for salinity come from wet regions, right? They don't come from the saltier portions of the ocean. So you're probably going to see an increased saltiness where it's salty than when it's fresh.
Okay, so why don't we uh, thank our speaker one more time.